We are prisoners on Earth. The universe taunts us by showing us all the places we can't ever visit. However, if our species wants to have a long-term future, we have to escape our prison. But what's keeping us here in the first place? Turns out we owe the universe a debt that is 4.5 billion years old. For real, what's that debt? Entropy? What is it? That could be it could be a number of things. Well, if you want to join my only physics, it's only uh, three dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> everything with mass in the universe attracts every other thing with mass. We call this phenomenon gravity. The Your mama so fat that <laughs> you guys ever heard those jokes about uh <laughs> closer you are to a big chunk of mass, the stronger the attraction or the more you're pulled in. This effect traps us on Earth. We can imagine this as being prisoners in a gravity prison or a gravity well. It's not a literal well, but a handy concept to understand how this works. It would be a well if you imagined space-time as a flat sheet, a two-dimensional flat plane. Uh, if you were to put mass then on, you know, on this two-dimensional flat plane, it would warp down like a well. And that is a way to imagine uh, you know, if it was 2D, but, but it's not. So you can't do that, right? We have three spatial dimensions, and we think of time as the fourth dimension okay so it's really not that accurate um, but it, it, it still helps think of something being in a gravity prison means that you owe gravity energy but how can you owe energy because in our universe things don't want to change their speed or direction to convince so just to pause someone said yeah the rubber sheet thing always bothers me it does but i think you know, if someone can get something in their head to think about when they're talking about this stuff, it might, like, maybe that's good, right? Because if you don't have any mental image of anything when you're talking about this stuff, I think that's just going to be harder. So I think even if it's an incorrect image, some image that allows you to try and work things out is probably better than none, right? ...them to move, you have to expend energy. Billions of years ago, the gravitational attraction of trillions of trillions of dust particles orbiting our sun pulled them together until they formed a planet. That's not true. So if you think you can do that, you're mistaken, my friend. You, you can't. Your brain doesn't work like this. There's many other examples of this as well that you people on the internet will be like, oh, you know, this kid imagining five dimensions or something. It's bullshit. This is not something you can do. We don't know if there are the higher spatial dimensions. So how are you going to ima imagine three dimensions bending into another spatial dimension? You can't. You would only be able to see the image of its the shadow. Uh, uh, you know these higher dimensions could make, for instance, a tesseract, which is like a four-dimensional cube. This is impossible for our brain because each like corner has to be at a right angle. Each each line has to be at a right angle to it, and you actually can't do that in three dimensions. But you can actually get the, the shadow of a tesseract, the four dimensional cube. But anyway, I just wanted to say that because you'll see a lot of bullshit or people think that, you know, physics people or, or smarter people can somehow visualize things that these other people can't, it's, it's not right. And for those people who are still arguing like, no, it's not good to have a false image. Just think about all the stuff, wonderful stuff we figured out with say virtual particles or Feynman diagrams. All of these mental images or, or Newtonian gravity, F equals MA, that got us to the moon, right? So having some mental image of something is useful and allows you to actually think about stuff, even if it's incorrect. So Feynman diagrams, you know, they are very useful. But what we say is happening in the middle is like where the virtual particles are. It's sort of like, we have no fucking idea if virtual particles are real or not. And, uh, but anyway, this, you, we could talk about this all day, but I want to watch this video. And it. This process used energy and created the gravity well we're now a part of. The deeper you are inside a gravity well, the more energy you owe gravity. If you don't find a way to get enough energy, you're not able to leave, no matter what you do. Because your atoms were once part of the dust that the universe expended energy on to get to this place. And if you're now wondering what happens if, you know, you put a black hole in this sheet that they've created here, well, this curvature, right? It would sink down to infinity. You, the curvature would become infinite. That means it would asymptote. It, it means there could be like another universe in there. And that's 
pretty much the whole idea of what's going on at the, the singularity, uh, if it even exists. And anyway, it's just all, a lot of what you've just heard is sort of misinformed because, you know, again, this space time itself is not like a flat sheet like this. So it's, it's not quite correct, but something to think about. More energy you owe gravity. If you don't find a way to get enough energy, you're not able to leave, no matter what you do. Because you've got to climb out of the well, right? So imagine trying to climb out of the well, you know, if, and if you're not strong enough, you, you can't get out. In a sense, that's exactly what it's like trying to escape our, our Earth's gravity. It's like trying to climb out of a well when you've got no arms or legs or something. <laughs> you know? Your atoms were once part of the dust that the universe expended energy on to get to this place. Okay. Hmm. Let's summarize all of that again. Objects in the universe don't like to move. You have to convince them to do so with energy. Gravity used energy to convince the parts that make up our planet to move together. This created a gravity prison in the process, trapping us. To escape it, we need to repair it with energy. Okay, how do we do that? Okay, so it's not really a debt. It's kind of just something intrinsic to something existing right whereas when he said a debt i thought you know a, a more accurate sort of physical thing for that would be entropy because it's like you know something you are accumulating at every point in time whatever that is uh and you know it's increasing entropy always increases for an isolated system um and so that is kind of like a debt that is going to be repaid in the future with the potential heat death of the universe or well, it depends on what you know the universe does, but that's what it looks like currently. To get into space, we need to go through a complicated process of exchanging energy. For this purpose, we build a negative potential energy repaying machines, known by their more boring name, rockets. Rockets work by using some of the most energetic chemical reactions humans know about to basically explode fuel in a controlled way. This converts chemical energy into kinetic energy. The exhaust of the reaction is directed outwards and pushes the rocket away from Earth. By expending a lot of energy, we are increasing our gravitational potential energy. Don't tell anyone, but uh, what's his name? Was <laughs> he, he got a degree in physics. You know, the Friedman guy. <laughs> You know, the guy who founded this thing. Which is a complicated way to say that we're paying back our energy debt to gravity. But it's actually a lot trickier than that. When you burn fuel to get into orbit, you lose lots of energy to heat, the exhaust and atmospheric drag, so you actually need much more. And you can't just pile a huge amount of really explosive, dangerous fuel close to your payload and detonate it. You need a yeah, control. And you're right, MIT physics. But uh, it should be said, you know, physics is the same everywhere. You know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't matter if you're at a university in India. If you study physics, you're still studying the laws of nature as we currently know them, right? The only real difference is, you know, it might be, the test might be slightly harder or something, you know? But everyone tends to use the same textbooks. Old burn, which is complicated and makes your rocket very heavy, which means it has more mass. The more mass something has, the more energy you need to convince it to move. So you need more fuel to lift up your rocket. But if you need more fuel, that means you need more rocket to carry that fuel. But this makes your I'm good, Gnostic. How are you, my friend? Rocket heavier, thus requiring more fuel, which requires more rocket to carry that new fuel, and so on. At the end of this madness, you need closer to a hundred times the weight of your payload to launch. Ariana 6, for example, the European rocket, will weigh 800 tons and should be... No, in that's not Ariana Grande that we're, you know, putting in this thing or something. ...to transport 10 tons into geostation... My physics class at Hustler University. <laughs> I'm sad that I even know what that is. Did you see they just let him back on, uh, on Twitter? I mean, I'm all for letting people back on Twitter, but, like, I wish this guy just didn't exist. Transfer we, need to, we need to come up with the physics of the Thanos snap and we'll just Thanos snap that guy. ...or 20 tons into medium Earth orbit. But a rocket can only produce so much thrust, so there's a hey, maximum ah, weight Pulcheri. after which Welcome it just won't take off. If you add too much, it won't lift off, so you can't just build bigger and bigger fuel tanks. This is the tyranny of the rocket equation, and it means spaceflight will never become easy. That's actually not quite true, you know? This is looking at it in the reference frame of those physics, right? 
there could be more physics to what's going on in the universe and guess what we're pretty sure there is and uh so that's what it will take not building bigger rockets but looking at things differently figuring out things we currently don't know and uh, if you do that who knows what we'll be able to do um, there really could be other ways of going i don't want to talk too much about them because they're quite um you know speculative and sci-fi uh, but there definitely is some possible things and i'm not talking about like any like wacky tesla bullshit uh i, I just mean like a, a new idea of gravity might you know reveal some interesting interesting th things about what reality is you know there could be ways to create like bubbles or wormholes and ways around doing these sorts of things so who knows but wait it gets worse getting to space is still not good enough you're still inside the gravity prison at the edge of space and will crash back to earth staying in space is much harder than getting there to get to a stable position where it can stay for a while a rocket has to reach low earth orbit to do this you need a lot of kinetic energy which means going extremely fast at an altitude of about 100 kilometers this is eight kilometers per second 28,000 kilometers per hour that is so fast what what was it that last uh let me see it again. this is eight kilometers per second I, going eight kilometers every second it's insane 28,000 kilometers per hour fast enough to travel around earth in 90 minutes here we can use a trick instead of flying straight up we can go sideways earth is a sphere so if you're going sideways fast enough even though you're falling towards earth the ground will curve away beneath you so as long as you're above the atmosphere about 100 kilometers up you'll be able to stay up there in orbit this is what the iss does falling around earth expending energy from time to time to stay fast enough if we look at orbits in scale we see that near earth orbit is laughably close to earth to deploy for example satellites or leave for other planets requires another round of energy debt repayment getting to orbit is the most difficult part that's of space. why the moon will be important if we want to go do stuff elsewhere in the solar system because we'll we'll be able to use it as like a gravitational assist as you go around it you can use it as like literally a gravitational slingshot thing that you always see in those movies there is a lot of truth to this slide for us right now for example if we want to send a rocket to mars half the energy is necessary just to get into orbit that's about <laughs> the speed people pass me with on the highway <laughs> yeah that's a good one and the other half for the 55 million kilometers that's the that's the largest bait i've ever seen in my life in twitch chat <laughs> what was it space flight will get even easier to incorporate <laughs> wait what are you saying space flight will get easier once we incorporate sacred geometry the tesla core oh jesus christ man i really hope you're trolling <laughs> to mars <laughs> don't take any of that seriously please <laughs> Therefore, to be as effective as possible, rockets aren't built in one giant piece. Help. Instead, we use multi-stage rockets. You don't need to carry an empty fuel tank, so rockets drop it. Rockets today shed their boosters and main stage as they ascend, with each successive stage being its own fully contained rocket, complete with its own engine and fuel. Okay, so this is why getting to space is hard. If you feel all of this seems really complicated, don't worry. It's literally rocket science. This video was made possible in part by a spot. Very complicated. Good luck to anyone who wants to do that. But anyway, before you leave, you should come check out CalVPN, a new post quantum VPN that I've built. And it's actually the first post quantum VPN people can use on the internet. Uh, you, there's none other one that it doesn't exist. This is the first one. And uh, they're going to be a thing soon. So if you want to come test it out the first one, come help the channel out come support me and uh yeah come test it you can choose your location connect it voila so uh, it can protect you from quantum computers but anyway that's enough with that